For those of us whose interest in analog photography extends beyond the realm of dropping off a roll at the lab, the rabbit hole goes deep. Developing your own film at home is one thing, but compounding your own developer solutions and learning to control the nature of the art is where the rubber meets the road for we dedicated travelers. As we seek to better understand this sacred knowledge, the living sources able and willing to teach us are few and far between. What's left are books and online discussions, treatises of this lost art written by those who came before us. One still operating site full of this Promethean fire is Unblinking Eye. The articles and formulas of one writer there, most of which were shared more than a decade ago, unlocked many essential secrets for me. His name is Harvey Euro. I decided to look the man up. I found two addresses, one of them was in California, near where some of the photographs listed in his articles were taken. I tried the number. There was no answer. I called every month for six months. One day in September, I tried again. After a few rings, a woman's voice was on the line. Hello, I'm looking for Harvey. Hold on, he's right here. And this is how I met Harvey Euro. You have any problems getting in? No. Good. How are you? All right. Harvey has an interesting take on photography, having worked his entire career for the Department of Defense as a chemist. You know, I know that you worked uh, with the Department of Defense. Yeah, Tell at the Edgewood Arsenal. What do you think were some of the strangest things you worked on during that time? Well, the most interesting, I think, was we would sneak back. We had people overseas in the Russian area or that part of Europe, and what they would do is they'd sneak back samples to us, bring it into this country, and have them analyze it to see, is, is, is it a new agent? And in fact, the Russians have been playing around with think, poisoning people. You, you read about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they've got certain chemicals that uh, we were looking at briefly, but uh, we didn't think anybody would start using them but apparently they're going back to it. Yeah, nasty stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's almost like a way to torture someone before uh, killing them. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable stuff. Harvey has conducted so many photographic experiments over the years, his research is a jumping off point for all of us interested in photographic chemistry. I was excited to hear a bit from the man himself. For those of us who are working in small spaces yes you know confined spaces you know we do our best to create good ventilation and yeah and whatever exactly but, but um if let's say you know, one of the main places that you're working is the bathtub and you know you're going to be getting some chemicals in there mm -hmm. what would be an ideal agent for cleaning that out at the end of a work session well usually uh if you go by the chemical core the basic one is bleach, hypochlorite. Hypochlorite. Yeah, which will get rid of most of it. Another one, but it gets messy, is permanganate. It'll also oxidize most of these uh, compounds, particularly sulfur ones. Uh, either one will hit sulfur compounds, and uh, very quickly, good kinetics, it'll uh, get rid of them. They'll uh, just break apart. Usually I, I clean uh, clean out my tub and then I pour boiling water a few times yeah. and I feel like... Bleach is not bad because uh, it's fairly easy to work with, you know, and, um, unless you get it in your eyes, obviously, but right. uh, otherwise it's pretty safe stuff to use. Well, that's, I think, a good note for everyone who's, who's yeah. working in smaller spaces. Mm-hmm. What would you say that using like a lot of restrainer on a developer would do? You change the color of the final image? Yes. I know with bromine it goes more towards uh, the warmer colors, towards brown. There are tricks you can play with certain developers if you add an excess of, uh, of bromide to them. From the perimeter of the image itself, you get things happening. You get uh, bromide from the silver bromide which comes uh, out, flowing out from that image, and that can, you can get what's called edge effects. Oh, yeah. so uh, extra bromide might create nice edge effects. Yeah. 
That's something I th I'm going to be looking into. Oh, yeah, yeah. The uh, formula you listed for when you're working with very old paper is, yeah. is the acid amidol. Yeah, that's a good one. And also, I, I found, I think others have found too, that the less sulfide you have in your developer, the less the fog will be. Because the sulfide dissolves some of your silver uh, bromide or chloride, and that will increase your fog. I see. So a uh, developer like D76 is definitely not ideal. No, no, not at all. I'd love to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Solution physical development, you know, is r right where you're uh, dissolving some of the silver in the paper and then it's replating onto the latent image. Yeah. How does that differ from standard development? I mean, how, how do you find the look is different? I would say the, the main difference you see is the color. It, it goes more, the more solution physical development you have, the more it goes towards the uh, warmer colors. With the ammonium bromide, right? Yeah, okay. You, you're, able to, you're able to bring a, a whole set of colors, and you said also... Yes. If you add thio -urea. Yeah, this is, this is Mises' method. Are you familiar with the original article? So if you were a chemist, you'd be interested in how come we, we get these colors. It's just basically a question of particle size. And with different particle sizes of the silver, you get different colors. The thiourea in the developer has pretty large effect on the particle size. And with different particle sizes, you get different colors. Apparently, they have some early daguerreotypes in which the sky comes out blue. And they say, how is that possible since uh, the color film wasn't invented for years and years? And apparently, you get uh, a certain effect in which the, um, the atoms in the image to sort of go in synchronization so that when the light comes out, it's, it, it's changing and, and it becomes blue. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to get into daguerreotypes and make uh, color prints, you can. <laughs> Do you think that there's a benefit to longer exposure and shorter development, or is there a benefit to shorter exposure and longer development? <laughs> Probably, uh, if it's uh, where you get color changes quickly, I'd say probably you'd want a, uh, a longer exposure rather than a shorter one. Harvey took me over to a side room to take a look into his freezer full of out of production, rare photographic materials. There's a lot of things you never told me about your research. He was very quiet. Uh, <laughs> it was, well, it, it was, was classified. classified. Yeah. <laughs> if he told me, he'd have to kill me, huh? Yeah, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> How was that living with someone Edgewood? working on that kind of? It didn't even. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> yeah. I was so busy Fair, raising our children that. The <laughs> let's put it this way: the directors were so specific in handling chemical agents, warfare agents, that I only know one person who ever got exposed, and then that was a freak accident, and he got mustard on his chest. He was doing a distillation, and one of the hoses uh, broke, and it sprayed on his chest, you know. Even though he was in a hood, there was enough of a space uh, where the mustard came through, 
and he, he's been having problems for quite a while because you get mustard. Yeah, nasty stuff. You know about mustard gas. Yeah, like we were talking about with Bhopal. The only other one we heard of that was in the, there were two sections. There was the Edgewood Arsenal and then there was the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And that was somebody we knew who lost his hands. Uh, yeah, well, that was peroxide. Well, we might as well tell you that story, too. So what happened was this guy, this chemist, had a bottle of uh, a peroxide, which is the, the nasty things that can explode at any time. And he took it out of the freezer where it was, and he was going to put it in the hood where he could start working with it, you know, with the remote controls. Right. And it blew up in his hands, and he lost both hands. Oof. Yeah. How does it blow up so quickly? Because it's got some, it's shock can do it. Any change in temperature or just shock, if you put it on the, on the table gently, it can still blow up like nitroglycerin. Right. Oh boy. Yeah. He survived. Were you ever worried? Yeah, I was, but not that much because he didn't tell me anything, and he worked with such small amounts. A small amount. That was yeah. the that was the thing. The name mm -hmm. of the game. Yeah, we were interested in determining trace amounts of these different uh, warf chemical warfare agents, so we never used uh, that much here to begin with. Uh, I'd love to ask you about. Growing up in New York City, you guys both ah. grew up in New York? Yes, mm -hmm. we did. What was that like? It was, was, it it was nice. I mean, it was I, grew, fun. We grew, I grew up poor, but somehow yeah. I was in a, we're both only children. We, had, we have no siblings. That's right. So that's why we made sure to have three. <laughs> Where were you from? Brooklyn. What neighborhood? Brownsville. Brownsville. Which is, uh, I don't know what it is now. It was, it was okay, but it was, it was a, a poor neighborhood. Mostly, I'm Jewish, we're Jewish, and Italian. Mostly Jewish and Italian. Italian uh, yeah. Right. And yeah. Where did you grow up? In Kew Gardens, which was right, in, maybe about five blocks from the Borough Hall. Because you moved. He was born in the Bronx. But yeah, I was moved born in the were... Bronx, and in 19, I think it was around 43, maybe. We moved to uh, Queens, to Kew Gardens. So in the Bronx, it was the Morris Park section. And then we moved. Uh, my father was a dentist, so he was looking for a new uh, dental uh, office. So we moved to uh, Queens, Kew Gardens. I said there was a time when we were dating that we would meet in the subway. I would, because he came from... Queens. I, well, the, it's interesting how we met. We met on a blind date. I was dating a, a college friend of his who lived in the Bronx. Yeah. And he, they switched, they changed numbers. They exchanged numbers of girls. And mm -hmm. Harvey got my number. For, and the rest is history. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was too much of a trip to go by subway from the Bronx to Brooklyn. But it was easier to go from Queens to Brooklyn because yeah. we we're all on Long Island. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. But we were a blind date. Yeah. That's Six, wild. We're married 66 years. Mm. We were married in Brooklyn. We were married in Brooklyn. Yeah. Where did you get married? <laughs> it was called the Hopkinson, the yeah. Deluxe Palace. If it's still there, which I On Howard doubt. Avenue in the Brownsville section. Yeah. There was a big street called Pitkin Avenue. Mm. Oh, sure. It's still there. It is? Oh, yeah. And it's, a, it's still a big... It's akin to like what 125th Street is like. It's okay. got a lot of shops and a lot of oh, Well, boy. it was the main um, shopping area when I lived there as a little girl. I didn't know what it was, what it was now. <laughs> Still there. There was a huge movie theater, the Low East Pitkin. Pitkin, yeah. I'm sure it's... It's still there. It is? You're kidding. I, they're not using it as a movie theater, but oh. it, the building is still there. You know, I've been out in front of it. movies were a big yeah. deal. It was, it was, it was a magnificent building, mm -hmm. the Lowy's Pitkin. Yeah. Yeah, and there was the Valencia, was the one in Queens. Yeah, the Lowy's. Yeah. Which was uh, same uh, architect, I think. 
Mm -hmm. No, it was wonderful. It uh, was fun back then, and it wasn't so in crowded. In the 40s and 50s, well, yeah. especially when we were dating, it was great. Yeah. It was great. We went to, uh, and we had we a went great to Broadway shows. They yeah. were reasonably priced. And we had a great mayor. Yeah. Well, yeah. For Who was one. the mayor then? Oh, when we were little. LaGuardia. Oh, and that was when we were yeah. children. Yeah, he was Mayor La Fiorello LaGuardia. Yeah. And then the city's gone downhill ever since. <laughs> not really, not really. Well, you know, I think it's had some ups and downs. It has its ups. Yeah. It has its ups. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's Lindsay and Koch was an interesting character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Agfa did a lot of work during the Second World War and they made a uh, number of publications on their uh, reports of the Agfa photo labs. And if you can get the book, and you can get it, if you're good in German, which I, I become, you can uh, figure out some of the things they did, which they didn't probably follow up on, but they put it down as a note in order for future investigation. So there are a lot of notes that could yeah, be followed yeah. up on. I was able to convince Harvey to take some of the old film out of the Kodak display case, throw it into one of his first ever cameras, and test it out on the lawn. Well, basement. when we had a house that was in the basement, it was fine. I always knew where he was. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Here is the print that I'm making from the photos we took, and this is how I met Harvey and Marion Europe. 